I'll make uh, I'll, I'll do. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do an example of that I, uh, that I think will help. After I do the example today, let me know if you still have questions. Okay. Um, we talked about constructors last time. And uh, what are constructors used for? Yeah. Okay. Used for, I'm going to add a little bit to what you said. Used for creating an object and possibly initializing certain attributes within that object, all right? If you do not specify any constructors, remember that a default constructor is generated by the compiler. And all that default constructor does is creates the object and allocates the memory for it. So it creates it in memory, it allocates the memory for it, and that's it. All right? If you supply any constructors, however, the default constructor goes away. All right? Think of it this way. Here's what I would make constructors for. I would make constructors if I thought that it was essential to set those properties as soon as I created the object. In other words, it makes no sense to have that object if it doesn't have certain values for the attribute. Take, for example, a student class. A student class might have student number, student first name, student last name, maybe phone number, maybe email address, maybe major. All right. So. Can you think of a student that doesn't have a student number? No. Can you think of a student that doesn't have a first name? No. Can you think of a student that doesn't have a last name? No. Therefore, I would probably put those in a constructor. So anytime I create a student, I would have to supply those fields for that student. Because I know those are like necessary. It doesn't even make sense to talk about a student that has no first name or last name or no student number or anything like that. However, it would be conceivable to have a student that didn't have an email address. I mean, forgetting like at Lorain County Community College, you, you're given an email address, though. Let's say a different uh, institution. It would be possible to have a student that doesn't have an email address. It would be possible to have a student that does have a phone number. And it would be possible for a student to not have declared a major. So those fields, I wouldn't include in the constructor because it's possible to have those without, uh, you know, without causing a problem. It's possible not to have those without causing a problem. So I might not include those in a constructor. Or if I did include those in a constructor, I'd allow people to put nothing in it. The other thing that you can do is create multiple constructors. So I can create a constructor for student, let's say, that accepts an integer and two strings. And that would be an integer for the student number, string for the first name, string for the last name. I could create a integer for a, a, a different constructor that had an integer and three strings whereas the first integer would be for the student number, the first string would be for the student first name, student last name, and the third string could be the student's email address. What I can't do is I cannot create two constructors that have the exact same number and types of arguments. So if I had a, if I had a constructor that accepted an integer, first name, last name, and major, I could not make a different constructor that accepted an integer for the student, string for the first name, string for the last name, and string for the major of the student, right? Because then the compiler wouldn't be able to differentiate between those two if you called that constructor. So let's look at this example. And we're going to go into a little more depth about exactly what happens when I call a constructor. Because this is important. Did 
then we'll try, we'll try to do a, a method to do the calculate the price of the pizza. Okay, in the pizza class, I have three constructors, okay? I have three constructors because I said these are things that I might know at the time that I create the object. I might know its size. I might know its size and the kind of crust that we have. And I might know the size, the kind of crust, and whether or not it has a pepperoni. So I've created three constructors, all with different arguments. I could not create a third or fourth constructor that accepted two strings, right? Because I already have one that uh, creates, that accepts two strings. All right. I could not create a different constructor that only had one string, because I already have a constructor that has one string. And if I did that, it would confuse the Java virtual machine about which constructor to be used. Notice the constructors that have less arguments, I default some of the fields. So this is a good example. You don't have to do it this way. Remember, this depends on the individual case that you're talking about. But in this case, my pizza class has three attributes. Size, crust, and has pepperoni. I have an argument for each of those in one of the constructors. So I can create the pizza object and initialize all three of these fields all at one time. Here I can create a pizza and initialize two of the attributes using arguments. And the third one has pepperoni, I can default. And finally, the last one I accept only a single argument, the size, and the other two attributes I default, the crust and has pepperoni. So I could not make a, another one like this and say, in this case, the argument's a crust and default the size to medium and set the crust to ARD crust. I can't do that. It'll give me an error. So let me go and try to compile this. I go and compile this. 
It gives us an error message. And the error message says, constructor is already defined in class pizza. And notice ex the precise wording of that, constructor pizza string. So I, r I already have an uh, a constructor that accepts a single string argument. So I can't have a second one. I can't have a second one because if I call the constructor with a string argument, there's no way the virtual machine would know which one of them I mean. So that causes the problem here. The fact that I have two constructors that have the same argument. This, by the way, is called overloading. We're overloading the constructor by having constructor that take multiple sets of arguments. But the sets of arguments can't be the same in number and type. It's the same idea for overloading functions. You can overload functions just like you can overload constructors. And you could do it for a similar reason. All right, and we might be able to find an example of that. Uh, if not today, then sometime in the future. All right, let's look to see what happens when we call these constructors. Spend a minute seeing exactly what happens. So I have this statement. Pizza P1, P1 equals new pizza. I don't remember having this example last time, but I'm glad we did, because I was going to do this anyhow. What happens if I try to compile this? Here's my three const oh. It's going to call this one. All right. What happens if I get rid of that constructor and I try to compile it? It won't compile because there's no constructor for no arguments. Now, didn't I say before that the compiler generates a constructor with no arguments? I think I said that at the beginning because we hadn't used constructors for the first few examples with this pizza here. Why, why not? And I said, well, because the Java compiler generates a constructor with no arguments. So why does this give me a compile error if I try to call constructor with no arguments? Exactly. The compiler only generates that empty argument constructor if you have no other constructors in your class. The compiler sort of thinks, gee, if they put in a constructor, they must know what they're doing with constructors, and therefore I won't interfere, I won't generate the ones with no arguments. All right? So I'd have to put in something that constructors that does exist, either the one, two, or three arguments. And I'll be OK. Now, let's look very closely at what this line does. And I find these on one line, or I can split it up in two lines. Let's look at these individually, all right? And I'm going to put some terms out that maybe we haven't talked about before, but it's okay, all right? We'll gradually go over these terms over and over again, and, and I hope it will start making sense for you. So let's look at the statement, pizza P1. What does that statement do? That creates what is called an object reference pointer. In other words, it, 
it creates a variable that's going to hold a pointer to an object. It's going to point to an object. Remember, objects are different than ordinary variables. All right? Ordinary variables, which are called primitive variables, typically only have a value associated with them. So an integer, an int, has a value of 10. So if I say int, Ten. It's going to create in a portion of memory called the stack a variable, a memory location called i, and it's going to give it the value of ten. It's upside down. Crap. Are we back right again? Okay. So int i creates a storage location named i on the stack, all right, on the stack. And if I say i equals 10, that puts the number 10 in that memory location. Really straightforward, all right? Now, it's different with classes and objects. If I say instead pizza p1 p1 equals new pizza small and thin try to squeeze that in what happens well the first thing that happens on the stack in a certain place in memory, a variable called p1 is created. And in this case, i is created, and it can hold any integer. In this case, p1 is created, and it can hold not any pizza, but a pointer to any pizza. Because remember, there's a lot of things about a pizza. And when we look at other classes and other objects, we'll see there's a lot of things about those too. There can be a lot of different attributes. There can be a lot of different methods. Classes and objects are much more complicated than primitives. Primitives only have a single value. So an integer has a value of 10. So all you need to know about that integer. Whereas a pizza has a size, it has a type of crust, has whether it has pepperoni or not. We could expand it into a whole bunch of things, whether it has mushrooms or not, whether uh, it's stuffed crust or regular crust, whatever. All sorts of properties we could have associated with it. So when I say this, that creates the object reference variable on the stack. So I have a variable called P1 that has the capability of pointing to a pizza. And that, we can't put anything else in there. If we tried to put a sandwich in there, if we had a sandwich object, if we tried to put a integer in there, if we tried to put a string in there, it's not going to work. By saying pizza P1, we can only store pointers to pizzas in that variable. OK, that's what this instruction does, or this part of the instruction if we have it all on one line. If, however, the next line says P1 equals new pizza, and I set those properties, that creates in a different part of memory called the heap. All right? And for right now, it's the details of what the stack, what the heap is, isn't terribly important. Just know that the heap's a different place in memory than the stack, OK? Create somewhere, at some location at the heap, some that, that there's a number associated with. I don't know. I just made something up, 2500. That's the memory location that it puts this object. And this object takes up a bunch of bytes, not just a few number of bytes like an integer would take. 
it creates that object on the heap that has everything associated with that object, the properties and the methods. And because we call the constructor, it initializes the size at S and the crust at thin. It is when I say P1 equals that, it means store the pointer of this new object in the variable called P1. So P1 now points to memory location 2500. So if I say P1, calc bake time, it will call the object that's at memory location 2500 and call the call bake time method on it. All right, questions? So that's really what happens when we call that statement. Now, there are some interesting things that we can do because we can have different variables pointing to the same object. All right? I could do something like this. Pizza P1 equals new pizza. And I can supply elements. I pizza P2 equals P1. All right. Notice that second line looks different than the first. I don't say new pizza, and I don't call a constructor. After these two statements executed, how many pizza objects would I have? You'd have one. All right. How many object reference pointers would we have to that object? Two. Right. So let's review what happened. Let's follow this through to understand. I hit this statement that says create a variable called P1 on the stack that's going to hold pointers to pizzas. And then new pizza object on the heap. Put it wherever you can. Let's say memory location 3000. And initialize those variables. So after the statement is done, I have a new object in the heap at memory location. We'll just say 3000. And I set the pointer to that memory location, 3000. Notice the next line says P1, P2 equals P1. Pizza P2 is going to create a different variable. And what's it going to store? Is it going to store a new pizza object or a pointer to a new pizza object? No. It's simply going to copy the pointer from the other variable. So both of these are pointing to the same object. Not two copies of the same object the same object, which means if I call a function on P1 to change something, I've changed that value for P2 as well. Let me demonstrate that. I'm going to put at the bottom of this some more code. Going to create pizza four. It's going to be large, thick crust, and has pepperoni. So I'm going to go and print out those values.
I'm going to say pizza five. equals P4. So at this point in time, P5 and P4 are pointing at the same pizza. The exact same pizza. Not pizzas that have the same value, but the same pizza exactly. And things They're going to be the same. Should be the same because they're the same pizza. Now, something for pizza five. I say P five dot set size medium. So I change the size attribute of P5 to medium. All right? If I press that again, think in your head, expect to have. And then we'll see if you're right, and we'll see if you understand why. All right, pizza four is large, thick pepperoni. Pizza five is large, thick pepperoni. I change pizza five to medium. Guess what? When I print out pizza four, it's medium as well as pizza five. Why? Because pizza four and five pay, point to the exact same pizza. If I change one, there's only one pizza to change. All right. So if I change one, if I ask for it by pizza four or pizza five, I'm going to get the same results because it's pointing at the same pizza. Consider it to be like two names for the same pizza, if you will. Two ways of pointing to a pizza. Is that clear to everyone? Or are there any questions for that? No questions? This is a good thing, and it's a thing that could get you into trouble. All right? You just have to be aware of this, because that's how the program is going to work. If I ask you, how many pizza objects are created in this unit test? How many pizza objects are created? There's four. It's the easy way to tell that. OK, you're right. There are pizza five points to pizza four. But how can I tell that only four of them are correct, corrected? If, for example, I, yes, if I said there's pizza one, pizza two, pizza three, pizza four, pizza five, I could think, well, there's five pizzas. It would be easier to count the instances of new pizza. OK. So wherever it says new pizza, a new pizza object is created. So at a glance, you can say one, two, three, four. There's four news in here. That means that there have been four objects created in this function. Yes? So new and then the class name. New and then the constructor. Yeah. New and then the constructor creates a new object and sets the properties of that object, of what's in the parentheses. All right? How long does an object live? All right? How long? That's a weird question. How long does an object live? Until it's gone. What makes it go?
Well, no, because I printed out the line of the cap here and here, and that was still there. What makes an object disappear? Now, it does have a garbage collector. What does that mean? Repeat the last part of it. Exactly. If nothing points to an object, the object disappears. So, I'll sketch this out on a sheet of paper, because it's kind of hard to show via code. But let's make a very simple thing to say, pizza P1 equals new pizza. And I'm going to put the details of the pizza, because it really doesn't matter. We're talking just about the number of objects. Pizza P2 equals new pizza. So, at this point, how many objects are there as instruction goes? There's two. What's the easy way to do that? Count the number of news. New creates the one pizza, new creates the next pizza. So then, if I were to do this, oh, yeah, if I were, well, let's draw it out. Pizza P1 creates a variable on the stack that can point to a pizza. This side is a new pizza object on the heap. Stores it at some memory location and stores that location in P1. Pizza P2 does the same thing. Creates a pointer to the location where the second pizza object is created. So this is what sort of a drawing of our memory looks like after those two statements execute. All right. First one creates the, the variable, creates the pizza on the heap, the pizza object, and points to it. This does the same thing. Now, say P1 so this guy points to this pizza. This guy points to this pizza. If I were to say P1 equals P2, what does that do? Well, it's going to put the value P2, the pointer, which is 4,000, it's going to put it here. So now pizza and P1 and P2 point to that second pizza. And no one points to that pizza in memory location 3000 on the heap. At that point, that's a useless object to you because you have nothing pointing to it. All right? So it's lost to you. Nothing you can do about it. Nothing's pointing to it, so you can't refer to it. So it would actually disappear and Java has what's called garbage collection. In this case, garbage collection means that it will get rid of an unreferenced object, and it will reclaim that memory. If it wasn't for this, you'd have a problem, because an application that created objects would keep using up more and more and more memory until eventually it would use too much memory and your machine would slow down, crash, whatever. In this case, though, it only keeps the objects that are useful. All right? If I'm pointing to that object, I can do something to it. If I'm not pointing to that object, none I can do with it anyhow, might as well get rid of it. So as soon as it has nothing pointing to it, from your perspective, it's gone and the memory will, at some short point in the future, be reclaimed by the Java Virtual Machine, so it could be used for other stuff. Okay, what I want to wrap up class with today is by putting another function 
on the pizza class to calculate the cost of a pizza. All right. Let's say the rule of the pizza is this. That. Small pizzas cost $8. Medium pizzas cost $10. Large pizzas cost $12. Thick crust is a dollar. Pepperoni is two dollars extra. So a large thick crust with pepperoni would be fifteen dollars. A small cheese pizza thin crust would be eight dollars. Does everyone see that? Okay. So let's go and write the code for this. So I'm going to create the function. Should the function be public or private? Well, what does public versus private mean? Right. Public would mean it's only able to be, oh, I'm sorry, private would mean it's only be able, being able to be called within this class. Well, I'm going to want my test class to call this object and call that method. So it better be public. So if you want other classes to be able to call this function, you have to make it public. And in this case, if you can imagine, our test class, later on our GUI, is going to need to call this method. So I'm going to say public. What is this going to return? What kind of variable is it going to return? Yes. Maybe an integer. Uh, I could make it an integer with the numbers that I put up on the board, right? Because they're all even dollar amounts. But I'm going to make it a double. So you're right. Could be an integer because everything's an even dollar. But like if I change the price of pepperoni to $2.50, I wouldn't want to have to change my code. So I make it a double that it's going to return. I'm going to have to name my function, which will be calculate price. Do I need any arguments? Do I need to pass anything to this function? Do I need to give anything to this function other than the attributes that are already defined for a pizza? Well, I this is on the pizza class itself. So I'm going to ask this pizza effectively, how much do you cost? All right. I don't need to give it a pizza because it already is a pizza. All right. What does the price of the pizza depend on? It depends on the size, the crust, and the pepperoni. And as you mentioned, whoever mentioned it, those are all attributes of a pizza. So I don't really need to give it any more information. Everything about, everything needed to calculate the price of the pizza is an attribute of the pizza. So I don't need to specify that. Your first step when you define a function. Create what's called the function signature. All right? What's the function signature? Private or public? What it returns? Name of the function and arguments. You had your hand up? Okay. Question? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to go to work and we're actually going to write the code that writes this function. I'm going to start out by declaring a double. I'm going to call it price. I'm going to set it equal to zero. All right, so I'm initializing price at zero. I'm then going to have a series of if statements to look to see if it's small, medium, or large. So I'm going to say if 
size equals small if size equals small what's the price equal to price equals to 8 and I'm going to have a similar thing for medium and large Ten dollars, twelve dollars. Am I done? No, we have to take into account the kind of crust. So, if crust equals when I say thick, then what do I do? I add to the price a dollar. Because what it says is the price is a dollar more than it would otherwise be. Then finally, I look to see if it had. So I could say if had equals true. Price equals price plus two. I could actually shorten this a tiny bit by just saying if has pepperoni. Why is that? Well, because has pepperoni is already a Boolean. So it's already something that's true or false. So I don't have to say if it equals true. I can just say if has pepperoni. And if it's true, that will happen. What's the last in this function? I have to return the price. I've done, I've followed the rules for the price of a pizza. I've come up with the price, but this function needs to return that price. So I need to say return price. Now, let's go and put this, let's test it. Oh my God, there's a little rabbit out there. Aww. The bunny wants to learn. Aw. Here, I'll move the screen so you can see it better. Just the word return price. So I could put here. Calculate price. Or P1. Then I can do that for the other pizzas. Okay. I've got to change bake time to price. So I'll go and do that.
So finally, I'm going to compile it and run it and test this. Bless you. All right, first pizza, price is $8. Is that right? It's small, thin crust, no pepperoni. Yep, $8. Second pizza is large, thin crust, no pepperoni, $12. This one is small, thin crust, pepperoni, price is $10. Is that correct? Yeah, because $8 for a small pizza and then the additional $2 for pepperoni. This is large, thick, true, $15. Of course this is going to give you the same price because it's the same pizza. Remember P4 and P5 point to the same pizza. So it better give you the same price. I then change it to medium and it changes the price to $13. Okay. Now, here's a question. How much do I need to test this? How do I need to make sure, how many pizzas do I need to make sure that I've tested what I have so far completely? As far as the price and the, let's just talk about the price and bake time. How many pizzas, let's just talk about the price. All right, forget about the bake time for now. How many pizzas do I need to test to test this completely? You have another number. I feel like an auctioneer. Higher, higher. Twelve. Well, let's think it through. How many pizzas, how many sizes of pizza are there? There's three. So, if the only thing that determined the price was the size, I'd need three pizzas. I'd need a small, medium, and large. But it's not the only thing. The kind of crust and whether it has their pepperoni or not. So, thick, thin, thick, Thin, thick, thin. A small thick, a small thin, a medium thick, a medium thin, a large thick, a large thin. So if those are only two things that made up the price, I'd need six. All right? But there's still another factor, whether it's pepperoni or not. So yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And if we can't find that the person that said 12 is absolutely correct. You need 12 pizzas to test this thoroughly. Now, that sounds like a lot, right? Well, yeah, testing is hard, all right? Anyone that's worked with software that blows up under certain circumstances or whatever, they're not testing. They're not, they're not having to test a dozen conditions. They're having to test hundreds, thousands of conditions, and they're bound to let one slip. Testing is harder than most people make it out to be. Let me just say that. And it's good to take a systematic approach to testing. All right? In other words, instead of saying, oh, let me just create a couple pizzas and test it. Yep, those three came out right. I'm good to go. Go and think of what are all the combinations. We could do some things to automate the testing. We could make a little loop, for example, if it got to be too many combinations, if we had all these different toppings or whatever. We could actually write code to do the testing for us. But in a case like this, it's pretty simple. We could create 12 pizzas. That sounds like a lot, but really, you're going to be creating one pizza, copy and paste it 11 times, change parameters, boom, test it, and you have a comprehensive list to make sure that all the conditions work out correctly. So when you're testing your code, 
I guarantee I'm going to write so many times this semester you don't have enough test cases because people really miss, uh, I was going to say misunderestimate it, misestimate or, or underestimate the number of uh, test cases that you need to do because you really want to be comprehensive. And then, now here's the interesting thing. What if we added bake time in it? Well, bake time only depends on the kind of crust on it, uh, on the pizza. So actually, these 12 cases would be sufficient to test, would, would catch conditions for bake time and for uh, price. We could actually write out a little matrix that this pizza should cost. 11 and a 10 minute bake time. This pizza should cost 10 and have a 10 minute bake time. We could actually do that and run it and we can look and say, all right, it gives me the results that I thought it should give me. I'm good to go. Questions about this? All right, uh, we'll continue next time with some more stuff, all right? I have to review my notes to see where we're at. I will post this example, <coughs> then I'll be up in lab.